Dear Heavenly Father above, Lord God, we, we all come before you today. We thank you, Lord, for this time of fellowship. We thank you, God, for uh, this conference. We thank you for all those who have labored to put this effort together. And we thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to defend your word in the Holy Scripture. Father, I just pray that uh, this presentation will be a blessing to those who hear. Please, Lord, help us to be strengthened in the faith in all things and to shine as your bright lights during our time upon the earth. We ask and pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right. All right, so uh, for those who may not have been here yesterday, my name is Chris Pinto, and I have a ministry, a, a film ministry, called Adullam Films. The name Adullam comes from 1 Samuel chapter 22. It's the cave that David fled to in the Old Testament when he was being persecuted by King Saul. And there all of the outcasts of Israel, it is said, gathered around him. He became their leader. And then they formed an army and went out and fought uh, against the enemies of ancient Israel. We've always believed that was a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who gathers the outcasts. And in our work, we fight the good fight of faith and defending the gospel and the word of God through our work in film and video production. Uh, we also have a radio program called Noise of Thunder Radio, which you can find on our website at noiseofthunderradio.com. Uh, we also broadcast on the Worldview Weekend uh, website. You can also find us on iTunes as well. Uh, but anyway, yesterday we've been talking about the defense of the traditional text of the Bible, which is called the received text, the textus receptus, the text received by all. Uh, the text that was gathered together, that was analyzed um, after the time of the Dark Age, what was called the Dark Age. And one of the points that I've tried to make in my work uh, in terms of communicating what happened through the Great Reformation and understanding why the term Dark Age exists. That term, they've tried to change it in modern times. If you watch the History Channel and things like that, they'll say, oh, the Dark Age was a time when people were just ignorant and they didn't know things and all this other kind of stuff. They really cover up the real history. The term Dark Age was so called because that was the period where the light of God's Word in the Bible was forbidden. The Bible was literally called the Forbidden Book. In fact, one of my favorite paintings from, uh, that describes that whole era is a 19th century painting, and it shows an older man sitting at a table, and there's his young daughter, who's a young woman, and the two of them are turned around and they have kind of a startled look on their face and they're sitting before a large open Bible. And it's as though someone has just knocked on the door and they turn fearfully as though they're afraid of who's there. And the painting is called The Forbidden Book or The Forbidden Reading. It's a very famous painting actually. Uh, but it signifies that time period that you could not read the Bible. If you were caught with a Bible, you could be jailed, tortured, beaten, and put to death. Uh, the Inquisition outlawed the Bible. The Inquisition outlawed the Ten Commandments. The Inquisition outlawed the preaching of the Gospel. And part of what I've tried to communicate to modern Christians, because for years I would talk to Christians, and whenever they would talk about uh, the role of Christianity in government, they would say something like, well... You know, Christian government produced the Dark Age, and that's when people got burned at the stake. And I would say to him, Christian government produced the Dark Age? Really? You, you mean it was Christian governments that outlawed the Bible? Christian government said you can't read the Word of God? Christian government said you can't preach the Ten Commandments and teach it to your kids? Now, yesterday I shared the, uh, the story that you find in Fox's Book of Martyrs, the story of Mistress Smith. Mistress Smith was a woman. She was interrogated by the Inquisition. They brought her in. They asked her a series of questions. She got through the questions. And when she got through the questioning, they gave her leave to go. Uh, and then the constable took her by the arm, and he heard a rattling in her sleeve. And so he opened her sleeve, and he pulled out 
these small wooden tablets that contain the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed. And so she was immediately charged with a crime, taken back in, they sentenced her and she was burnt at the stake and put to death. That's why she was put to death. And in reality, what happened was through the 19th century, and I talked about this a little bit yesterday, what happened through the 19th century is the same groups that once ran the Inquisition that was about suppressing the Bible, suppressing the preaching of the Gospel and the Word of God, those same groups repackaged and reinvented themselves through social justice, socialism and communism in the 19th century. And part of their target, we believe, was the Bible. Because they know that the Bible is what brought about ultimately the Great Reformation and gave birth to the free world. How many people know? John Wycliffe in 1384 was the first to translate the Bible from Latin into Middle English. And when he did in the introduction he wrote this Bible is for a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. How many people remember being taught that in school? No? One or two people knew that. One or two people knew that. Most people are not taught that at all. That that's where that phrase comes from. But it was the whole idea that the common people have a right to be governed according to the laws and the commandments of God, which were being suppressed by the Inquisition, by the kings, etc. They didn't want God's law to prevail. They wanted their own ideas to prevail. And the reason I think this is important is because this is exactly what's happening in the Western world today. It's why they're suppressing the Bible. They want to take the Ten Commandments down and they want to replace it with other ideas of right and wrong. Now, all of this came to a climax in the 19th century with the development of what is called the critical text. To understand the critical text, we're going to talk more about it today. Uh, David, in his presentations, he keeps um, uh, making mention of the papyri and the significance of the papyri that were discovered in the 20th century. And we're going to talk about that on the, uh, in this presentation. But I want to start with where I kind of ended in my earlier presentation, talking about the foundation of how they changed the Bible. How did they do it? What was the argument that they have used? And how can you understand it? When you read in your Bibles, if you go to the uh, ending of the Gospel of Mark in many modern study Bibles, you'll have a footnote there that says that on the last 12 verses of Mark, where Jesus appears bodily after the resurrection from the dead, There'll be a footnote there that says the last 12 verses are not contained in the most ancient and reliable manuscripts or the most ancient manuscripts. They give you a variation of how it reads. But the manuscripts they're talking about are the Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Sinaiticus. And that's what we've been discussing in many ways and different ways. Really, a lot of these critical text arguments come back to these two manuscripts. In fact, I recently saw a presentation with Dr. Dan Wallace, who is a, uh, he's a big critical text defender. He defends the New Bible Movement, for example. But he was uh, asked a question about what's the difference between the New Bibles versus the King James. And his response, you can watch this video online, uh, I played his audio on my radio show, but he said, uh, he said, well, Erasmus, when Erasmus put his text together, he only used six manuscripts, he said. He said, now today we have over 6,000 manuscripts. This is what he said, over 6,000. Now anybody who knows the critical text knows that they don't use 6,000 manuscripts, not even close. They use two and then a handful of papyri. And what he did not tell his audience is that 95% of those 6,000 manuscripts agree with Erasmus and the King James, the authorized version. That's what, that's what he did not reveal to his audience. And I stopped the audio and I said to my radio program, I said, that is critical text sophistry. That's what that is. 
It's a very deceptive, misleading argument. All right, well, let's talk about the foundation of this work. Codex Vaticanus, which is also called Codex B. Now, what I went over with today, when they tell you that these manuscripts are the oldest, the most ancient, and then they say they're the most reliable, okay? The argument, as we said yesterday, in a nutshell is, because they're the most ancient, that means they're the most reliable, and where they disagree with a King James text, that means the King James is wrong. That's their argument in a nutshell. All right, so their premier manuscript is Codex Vaticanus, Codex B. Now yesterday we talked about Desiderius Erasmus. When he was putting together the received text, uh, Erasmus knew about the Codex Vaticanus. He knew that it existed. He communicated with the Vatican librarian, uh, Sepulveda, and Erasmus rejected the text because he believed it was a forgery. And he believed it was a forgery or a corruption. And just, just a word on that, uh, on the use of the word forgery. If you go and do additional study, the word forgery, it's kind of hard to grasp at first when you're reading commentaries on it and so on. Because you read the word forgery and immediately you think of something that was deliberately done. And sometimes it means that. Other times the word forgery can just mean something that was corrupted somehow, whether deliberately or not, and it appears to be something other than what it is. So it doesn't always mean it was deliberate. That's kind of hard to grasp, but if you read enough commentaries, you begin to see that. So whether or not Erasmus believed this was deliberate, he actually did. He believed it was done in secret at the Council of Florence. So, uh, Erasmus rejected Vaticanus. According to John Owen, a Puritan minister, he said the Vatican boasted uh, uh, of the Vatican manuscript, boasted of by Huntley the Jesuit, which Lucas Bregensis affirms to have been changed by the vulgar Latin, that's the common Latin, which was written and corrected, as Erasmus says, about the time of the Council of Florence. That's the quote, by the way, David, that I was talking about where Erasmus suggested that it was written during the Council of Florence. Okay? It was actually created during the Council of Florence. It may be that it was an older manuscript that was then overwritten uh, and corrupted somehow. It's hard to say. Okay, that it was written and corrected, as Erasmus says, about the time of the Council of Florence when an agreement was patched up between the Greeks and the Latins. The purpose of the Council of Florence was it was an ecumenical gathering between the Church of Rome and the Greek Church. They've had an animosity, uh, an enmity that goes back centuries. And in fact, you see it up into modern times, if you know where to look for it. Even up through World War II, there are rivalries between the Greeks and the Roman Catholics. Um, but the purpose of the Council of Florence was to try and get the Greeks to alter their text to make it match with the Latin Vulgate. And of course the Greeks said no. So there was sort of a rumor that Codex Vaticanus was one of these manuscripts that had been somehow or other created or tampered with or whatever in Greek to make it seem like it was more in favor of the Latin Vulgate. Now if you study the, the, uh, this rivalry between Latin and Greek where Rome is concerned, J.A. Wiley, the historian, said that Rome always hated the Greek language because all those who ever learned Greek became heretics. That's what he said because it was when the Greek manuscripts come into Western Europe, Erasmus studies them, Luther studies them, the reformers study them, they realize that there are significant changes from the Greek to the Latin. For example, as I said yesterday, where John the Baptist says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, in the Latin Vulgate it reads, do penance for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so the whole system of penance, a works-oriented system of righteousness in Romanism, was dependent upon a mistranslation in the Latin text. 
And so Erasmus discovers in Greek that no, it's not do penance, it's repent. You change your heart and your mind and you turn toward God by faith and come to the salvation of the Lord. So the sacramental salvation, the works-based salvation that Rome was peddling through penance and indulgences and so on, all of that collapsed as a result of the recovery of the Greek text and then its publication by Erasmus, Luther, and others, and then the widespread publication of the Bible. This is how the Holy Roman Empire was ultimately dismantled. Okay. So Erasmus rejects Codex Vaticanus. It was rejected from the 16th century all the way to the beginning of the 19th century. And as David has pointed out in his uh, presentations, it was rejected and nobody seemed to really think anything of it until you get to Johann Leonard Hug, J.L. Hug, in the year 1810. He publishes a pamphlet called On the Antiquity of Codex Vaticanus. Prior to that, you had all of these debates as to where Vaticanus came from. Nobody knew where it came from. It has no history whatsoever until the year 1475 AD. Now this is very, very important because they, they say that the manuscript dates back to 350 AD or thereabout. But it has no history prior to 1475. And they have no way of proving where it comes from. Okay, so J.L. Hug, who was a Roman Catholic scholar and critic, he's the first to say that it comes from the fourth century. Now, the history of it, as I said yesterday, and I'm just recapping before we get into the rest of it, uh, J. Neville Birdsall, who was a leading paleographer in the 20th century, openly admitted that tracing the Codex Vaticanus cannot be done outside the 15th century. And he said, in short, we cannot be certain of the exact date nor the place of origin of Codex Vaticanus, nor in spite of scholarly efforts can its history before the 15th century be traced. It has no history before the 15th century. Then Birdsall goes on to say, that Codex Vaticanus remained um, isolated, unused. Nobody ever used the manuscript. Nobody ever thought it was of any significance. Many people thought it was a forgery or a corruption, uh, a Latinized Greek text for hundreds of years. It was ignored. Until, Birdsall says, it was the discovery of the Codex Sinaiticus in the same period in the 19th century that enabled scholars to perceive the distinctive form, etc. And then they began to claim that this was the Western text and that it was part of a family of manuscripts. Now, um, the reason this is significant is the way, the way to understand the discovery of Codex Sinaiticus. If, if any of you has ever been on a motorcycle before, like a big Harley, and you have a big motorcycle, and it's a big heavy bike, and it leans to one side or another. And if you're not careful, the bike can tip all the way over and fall to the ground, right? Because they're pretty heavy. But you have a kickstand, and you put the kickstand down, and that stabilizes the bike, and now it'll stand up. That's the relationship between Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. Codex Vaticanus on its own, that's their big manuscript, that's the one that they wanted to promote. But by itself, it can't be defended because it had strange, oddball readings in it for which there was no confirmation from any other manuscript on the planet. In fact, most every other Greek manuscript that was known disagreed with Codex Vaticanus in many places. And the uh, biggest uh, disagreement was the last 12 verses of Mark, the ending of Mark's gospel, where in Codex Vaticanus they have a blank spot and those verses are not there. Well, there was no other manuscript in Greek that had that characteristic all the way up until the 1850s. Then, with the discovery of Codex Sinaiticus, first in 1844, then in 1859, 
Now they have a second manuscript that has these strange, unique readings in it. The most startling of which is the omission of the last 12 verses of Mark. Okay? And so now you have a co-witness. And see what they do in textual criticism is if you have a, a strange manuscript that has these strange readings to them and nobody's ever seen them before, nobody knows where they come from or what they are, they say, well, it's an anomaly, we don't know, they just put it aside. And it has no authority. But if they find another manuscript, now they say, well, we've identified a so-called manuscript family. And so that supposedly gives it weight and authority. Now, I personally believe, and I'm going to show you as we go forward, that the manuscript family argument, and especially once we talk about the papyri, is a bogus argument. It's a completely ridiculous argument that makes no sense whatsoever. All right, but the Codex Sinaiticus is discovered in 1844, then in 1859. Within less than a year, we have a Greek paleographer named Constantine Simonides. He comes forward, and he claims that he was the true author of the manuscript. That Codex Sinaiticus is not an ancient manuscript at all, but it was a manuscript that he created in the year 1840. And it was intended to be a gift to the Tsar of Russia. And he tells the story of how he delivered it to St. Catherine's Monastery uh, and all the details that happened and that Tischendorf stumbled upon it and he wrongly identified it as an ancient text when in reality it was created in 1840. Okay, and uh, David's done a lot of research into this. We cover this in, uh, in my documentary film, Tears Among the Wheat. There's a lot of details to it. And the story of Simonides is very, very interesting. It's a fascinating history because the textual critics have covered it up. And they typically don't tell students in Bible colleges about this whole episode. But Simonides spent four years arguing in the newspapers and privately that he was the real author of Codex Sinaiticus. He went to his grave arguing that he was the one who created the text. He debated with uh, newspapers and with scholars and so on in London uh, for several years and then he finally just said to them, I have told you the truth, my conscience is clear, I can stand before God on the day of judgment, I've let you know what this manuscript is, it's up to you if you want to believe it, and then he left. In 1907, all of that, the Simonides affair, and there's a book, if you wanted to get a lot of the details on the newspaper articles, there's a book you can find online called Codex Sinaiticus and the Simonides Affair by J.K. Eliot. And it literally, the reason I like the book, uh, and I had recommended it to David years ago, he and I talk about it, but the reason I like the book is because the book is really, it's just 95% of the book is the newspaper articles from the 1860s when all of this went on. And there's very little commentary from the author, J.K. Eliot. He just directs your thinking here and there. But you can see what happened. And the way the whole story unfolded, it unfolded for several years and then finally this letter comes from a Greek monk or somebody claiming to be a Greek monk and they said, well, Simonides cannot be the author of Codex Sinaiticus because the Codex Sinaiticus was contained in the ancient catalogs at St. Catherine's Monastery. And because of that, that's proof that Simonides could not be the author. Well, then Simonides wrote back and he said, I emphatically deny that Codex Sinaiticus was contained in the ancient catalogs because no ancient catalog exists at St. Catherine's Monastery and it never existed. That's what he said. Well, well, in spite of that, nobody ever went to look for this ancient catalog. They just ignored the issue and they chose to say, well, this discredits Simonides. That's how they discredited him. And to this day, we've communicated with St. Catherine's Monastery and with Dr. Daniel B. Wallace who also has a, a, a close uh, 
relationship with St. Catherine's Monastery, and they admit to this day, over 150 years later, there is no ancient catalog, and there never was. Never was. James Farrar, in 1907, James Farrar was a, a British barrister, a lawyer. And barristers, if you study barristers, barristers are not only attorneys at law, but they also investigate the history of law. So they're, they're researchers, they're historians, and they're lawyers. And Farrar um, had an opportunity to go and interview J.E. Hodgkin. Hodgkin was a close friend of Simonides, and he saw all of these events unfold. And so Farrar examined it from a legal perspective, like a lawyer would in a court of law examining evidence. And here's what he said. He had a lot to say about it, but I'll just give you this quote. He said, on the side of Simonides is his unlimited skill in calligraphy, the very audacity of such a claim, if entirely baseless, the remarkable presence in the codex of a portion of the Shepherd of Hermas, which Simonides was the first scholar ever to have seen in Greek. The fact that no visitor to the monastery at Mount Sinai before 1844 had ever seen or heard of such a work as belonging to the monks. That's another remarkable detail. Nobody had any record of this manuscript prior to 1844. Nope, nope, there was no record that it existed. Farrar says, the question therefore, pending the acquisition of further evidence, must remain among the interesting but unsolved mysteries of literature. That's what he calls it. Whether or not Codex Sinaiticus, the manuscript that pop, props up the Codex Vaticanus, whether or not it's a genuine manuscript is called an unsolved mystery of literature. Now, the remarkable thing to me is in our Bible colleges, the students in our Bible colleges the, the people who are training the next generation of pastors, teachers, as church leaders, are not being given access to this information. Even though James Farrar's book, Literary Forgeries, is called, in critical text circles, a classic work by guys like Dr. Bruce Metzger. Called, referred to it as Farrar's classic work, Literary Forgeries. But nowhere are they being told that there are those who believe Codex Sinaiticus could very well be a 19th century manuscript. But they claim that Sinaiticus dates back to the 4th century, to about 350, 353, 354, whatever. They have all of these fictional histories that they've created based on speculation and imagination. Histories that they have absolutely no way of proving. And part of what I've tried to point out in my documentary series, especially part three, Bridge to Babylon, is to, to, to wake up the Christian community to this and to at least say, I mean, you know, what I would say to Bible colleges is, okay, you know, if you want to keep promoting Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, I ended up debating um, Dr. James White, who is one of the leading apologists for the critical text, okay? and arguing against the traditional readings of the King James. And James White argues against things like Luke chapter 23, where Jesus was on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. James White argues that's not part of the original text. That's one of the many arguments that he makes. Um, and so, but I had an, an opportunity, I debated him on the issue of Codex Sinaiticus and since that debate and since the film came out, there have been now four books, at least, that have been written. One of them by David Daniels, uh, Is the World's Oldest Bible a Fake? There's another book, uh, The Forging of Codex Sinaiticus by Dr. Bill Cooper over in the UK. Then there's the book, Neither Oldest Nor Best by David Sorensen, Dr. David Sorensen. And uh, then Dr. Jack Mormon, who also appears in our series,
He wrote a book called Sinaticus Created in 1840? Question mark. Okay? So there are, there's more and more material, thank the Lord, being produced where people are questioning this narrative. Now, Codex Sinaticus is very important for a variety of reasons. One, it is part of the foundation of the critical text. It's part of what drives the new Bible movement. But even more than that, because it has so many corrections in it, because it has between 23,000 to 35,000 corrections in it, an average of 30 corrections per page, according to the British Library that has the manuscript in their possession. When you hear on the radio or TV somewhere or you hear a commentator or a critic say, well, the Bible's been rewritten over and over again. We just can't be sure what it really said. And when they're casting doubt on the readings of the Holy Scripture, the number one reason they do that is because of Codex Sinaiticus. And you can go online. There was a uh, BBC documentary produced on this. Um, about the Codex, and you just listen to the narration. And there's this Oxford scholar who shows up there, and it's a woman, and she's talking about how, well, prior to 1859, the English-speaking Protestant world, well, they had the King James Bible on the shelf. They believed it was perfect. It was inerrant. And then Tischendorf makes this discovery. They openly admit that the discovery of Codex Sinaiticus is what began to change the evangelical world. You see, the Catholic world at that point wasn't reading the Bible. They weren't allowed to read the Bible. The people who were being affected by this were your Protestant evangelicals. And they were the ones who were targeted. So from that time on, in fact, there was another scholar, I watched an interview with him, he talked about the shock waves that Codex Sinaiticus sent into the evangelical churches. And what happened is, as the, the idea that this is the world's oldest Bible, that this represents, you know, the... In fact, uh, Dr. Scott McKendrick at the British Library, who has the manuscript, and he's the head of the Codex Sinaiticus project there, he says in the documentary, he points to it, and he says, this Bible is the ancestor of all the Bibles that everyone else has in the world. That's what he says. The ancestor of all the other Bibles in the world. And what is it? It is a mass of confusion. It's a mass of contradiction. It scribes I mean, I listened to a, a commentary from Dr. McKendrick where he's talking about this, and he's saying that, that he says there's this struggle going on in the manuscript. And what's the struggle? It's different scribes arguing about what the readings are supposed to be. And one scribe says this way, the other one says that way, and they're changing it an average of 30 times per page. And so this is the weapon that they use in the academic world to argue that you can't really believe the Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God. Okay? But that's why I say it's this story of Simonides and the analysis by James Farrar and others, because there were other scholars who were not necessarily sold on the idea that Sinaiticus was a genuine ancient manuscript. They had a lot of questions about it. All right. So, let's do a break. Let, let's review quickly the critical text breakdown. The problem with the critical text. One, their foundation, which is Codex Vaticanus, which I'm going to explain to you more here in just a minute. I'm going to give you a great quote. But there's no historic evidence by their own admission, by the admission of these scholars and academics, to support Codex Vaticanus prior to 1475 AD. No historic proof. No historic proof to support the existence of Codex Sinaiticus prior to 1844 AD. Right there, the, the entire argument for the critical text collapses. It falls to pieces. And then, no historic evidence to support the Westcott and Hort theory of 1881. Just to review very quickly what their theory was, their theory was that 
because Vaticanus and Sinaiticus were the oldest, the most ancient, any other manuscripts that disagree with them must be wrong. So then how did all these other manuscripts develop these longer readings? How is it that other manuscripts have the last 12 verses of Mark? How is it that most of the manuscripts have the story of the woman taken in adultery? John chapter 8. How is it that they have Luke 23? Where Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How did those verses all get in there? And why are they in 95% of the manuscripts quoted by most of your ancient early church fathers? The vast overwhelming majority of Christian materials throughout history contain and support these verses. How did that happen? According to Westcott and Hort, uh, it was because church leaders got together and they added these verses between 250 and 350 AD. That was their theory in a nutshell. But of course, as uh, Dr. Scribner and others stated, there's absolutely no historic proof that any such thing ever happened. It was entirely invented out of their imagination. But what was at the root of this theory? What inspired the theory to say, well, they must have, somebody must have come along and made all these changes. What was the foundation? Well, Dean John Bergen tells us what the foundation was. Dean John Bergen was a leading critic, a leading scholar back in the 19th century. And he was a very zealous defender of the gospel, of the word of God, of God's promise to preserve the Holy Scripture. In fact, there's a beautiful quote from Dean Bergen where he simply says, he's, he's gone through all these arguments, and he just says, I simply cannot believe that the promise of God has failed. He just refuses to believe it. Refuses to believe it. And of course, all the evidence is that God's promise has not failed. God promised he would preserve his word, and he has. Um, but these critics have shown up and they've created all of these distractions. But Bergen examined the Westcott and Hort theory. He said it was about 150 pages long. He examines this theory. Once he gets to the end of it, he realizes what this is all based on. And here's what he said. He says, quote, Thus then, at last, at the end of exactly 150 weary pages, the secret comes out. The one point which the respected editors are found to have been all along driving at. The one raison d'etre, or reason for being, of their fiction of a Syrian and a pre-Syrian and, and a neutral text, all these terminologies they invented, the secret of it all comes out at last. All is summed up in the curt formula Codex B. Codex B. Codex B is another name for Codex Vaticanus. They call it Codex B. And he says that's the formula, Codex B. Anything, so it starts with Codex B, Vaticanus. Codex B is supported by Codex Sinaiticus. And anything that disagrees with those two must be wrong. Got to be thrown out. And Bergen even goes on to say that the way that they have engineered this theory is that 95% that of the manuscripts, early church writings, etc., that it all must be sacrificed, he says, on the altar of Codex B. That's almost like a human sacrifice or something, or some ritual that they're going through, Westcott and Hort, where they're going to destroy most all of church history so they can justify this completely absurd theory that they've come up with. Now, there are many people who have opposed the Westcott and Hort theory throughout history. Now, one of my favorites to point to <laughs> is the great, great Protestant minister in Northern Ireland, Dr. Ian Paisley. He is one of my favorites. Dr. Paisley passed away a few years ago. I quote him all the time on my radio program. I play audio from him. Uh, Dr. Paisley was a very zealous defender of the King James and the traditional text of Scripture. And he was a very strong opponent to Rome there in Northern Ireland. He, he was not only a Protestant minister, 
as, as a preacher. He preached at the uh, Martyrs Memorial Church there for decades. Uh, but he was also a politician. He was a political figure. And he became the first minister of Northern Ireland. First minister as in the prime minister. Okay, that, but that, they call him the first minister. So he was the leader of Northern Ireland for many years. But he, uh, he publicly opposed the encroachments of Rome on their political system. And you see some of the signs that he and his supporters have there. Jesus saves Rome enslaves. That's one of them. Uh, the other one says, Let Glasgow flourish by the preaching of the word and praising of Christ's name, not the Pope's. Not the Pope's. They're very, very uh, bold, bold witnesses there in Northern Ireland. So, here is another image of Dr. Ian Paisley. This is uh, back in the 20th century when Pope John Paul II came to the uh, European Union, the European Parliament. Dr. Paisley famously stood up there and started shouting, uh, I denounce you as Christ's enemy and antichrist with all your false doctrine. I denounce you, I denounce you. And he's shouting down the Pope uh, and holding up a sign that says Pope John Paul II, antichrist. Now, it, it, very, very interesting. You know, the Bible says there are many antichrists gone out into the world. And uh, Dr. Paisley seemed to go back and forth from the traditional reform view that the papacy was the antichrist to simply referring to the popes as antichrist. I remember when, uh, when uh, Pope Francis was appointed, uh, I think it was John MacArthur who preached a sermon and he said, welcoming another antichrist. So Dr. Paisley, sh and then they grabbed him and they punched him and pulled him out of the room there. Uh, but anyway, here's what uh, Dr. Paisley said about the Westcott and Hort theory and their celebration of Codex Vaticanus. He said, quote, those who claim they had found the true word of God in the Antichrist bookshelves in the 19th century and set out to doctor all the Bibles in the world to conform them to the Roman imposture only demonstrate their total ignorance of God's precious word. From the devil's bookstore, they took the devil's product and as sons of the father of lies, they marketed its lie as truth. Okay? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, don't candy coat it, <laughs> you know, just come right out with it. But notice what he says here. He understood the theory. They claim they found the true word of God in the Pope's library, right? And then they set out to doctor all, get all the Bibles in the world to conform basically to Codex Vaticanus. That's essentially what they did. That's the Westcott and Hort theory in a nutshell. Dr. Paisley went on to say, he said, no Bible believer should be deceived by the parading of great names in the field of biblical scholarship when these very men are but the parrots of the rationalists of another century. The case they present is not their own, but a modern presentation of an ancient heresy. That's another very important point. When you're listening to these, to pastors or teachers or whatever, most of the arguments that they're making when they're making these critical arguments, they did not originate those arguments, and those arguments typically came from unbelieving scholars, people who never believe the Bible is the word of God. I mean, Westcott and Hort, you read their writings, it's very clear they did not believe in biblical inerrancy, but they even went so far as to put a Unitarian on their committee. A guy who did not believe the gospel, did not believe Jesus Christ is the son of God, did not believe uh, the Bible is the word of God. And there was a great outcry when this happened back uh, in the 19th century. Now, here's another powerful quote from Dr. Paisley. He says, the Bible is not the production of man, but the product of God. It is the word of God. It was not delivered unto the scholars, Greek, Hebrew, or otherwise, but to the saints. The faith which, which was once delivered to the saints. Jude 3. And I've always thought that was a very powerful point. Remember when I first read that quote? It just, uh, it, 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 it arrests you. It, it, it really defines the issue. 
we have all these unbelieving scholars that are handling the text of Scripture, telling us what the true readings should be. But the faith was not delivered to scholars and academics. The faith was delivered unto the saints. Dr. Paisley said, the attempt to bamboozle the ordinary saints of God with irrelevant controversy must be demonstrated. Most of these arguments they make, if you listen to them and once you break them down and, and see what they're arguing about, that's what they are, irrelevant controversy. They're stirring up problems where, the, where problems really don't exist. He says, the ploy to take from the saints their divinely appointed role of custody of the book and place it in the hands of scholars must be exposed for what it is, a device of the devil himself. All right, here's another quote from the 19th century, just to show you that there have been men from the very beginning, from as soon as Westcott and Hort did their work. Dean John Bergen was probably the most prominent of them, but there were many others who opposed what they had done. Uh, one of them was William Garden Blakey. And he said, uh, quote, what we contend for is not the printed text of the 16th century, but the text received by the whole of Christendom. The passages that we're talking about, brothers and sisters, and the issues that we're talking about, th these are not one church's version of the Bible versus another. This is the Bible. Th this is what everybody thought the Bible was all the way until you get to 1881. In fact, uh, I remember hearing an interview with Dr. Dan Wallace, and they were talking about the last 12 verses of Mark, that whole issue. Last 12 verses of Mark. And Dr. Wallace was being interviewed by John Ankerberg, I think it was. And John Ankerberg is a conservative teacher. He's a conservative teacher. I, I would agree with much of what Dr. Ankerberg says. But here he is with Dr. Daniel B. Wallace, who's also presented as a conservative. And Dr. Wallace says, they're, they're talking about the last 12 verses of Mark, and Dr. Wallace says words to the effect of, well, we've known for about 150 years that uh, the last 12 verses of Mark are not genuine or part of the original text. That we've known that for about 150 years. Now think about what that does to the faith of people who are young in the faith, to people who are trying to continue in the faith, people who are trusting the Bible, when they hear that, well, the church believers have only known for 150 years? You, you mean for 1900 years? Christians believe these verses were true and in fact they were a fabrication and and then that that pertains to John chapter 8 as well and that pertains to all these other passages as well what does that do that does what I call it puts the perpetual question mark on the Bible you now have to wonder well what other passages do we currently believe are genuine that they're going to come and tell us are not genuine a month from now, six months, a year, two years, etc. It creates perpetual uncertainty. And yesterday, uh, for those who uh, were here for the presentations then, uh, I talked about how Dan Wallace, Dr. Dan Wallace, and the Jesuit Superior General both openly proclaim that scholars do not know what the exact words of Jesus really were that we just don't know, we don't have any way of knowing. Because they rely upon manuscripts that are a mass of contradiction and continual changes. All right, here's a quote from George Sales Bishop. George Sales Bishop, he was another late 19th, early 20th century scholar. He said that the revised New Testament is the most unreliable text perhaps ever printed. And he wrote a long, uh, work, a long book you can find online where he just went over the whole thing and uh, he denounced the, the work and the theory of Westcott and Hort. Robert L. Dabney, also called R. L. Dabney, he exposed the fact, he said, the grand foundation of the whole is a bundle of conjectures. The whole thing is just, well, if this is true, then maybe that and perhaps this, 
etc. They're just conjectures, they're theories. They have no way of proving what they are asserting. A. E. Hausman, another 19th century uh, textual critic, in fact if you go study modern textual criticism, they will often point students early on to the writings of A. E. Hausman. He's like one of the guys that they want you to read. Well, A. E. Hausman said, quote, textual criticism is not a branch of mathematics, nor indeed an exact science at all. It deals with a matter not rigid and constant like lines and numbers, but fluid and variable. But it's not presented that way. What does he say? He says, he says, it therefore is not susceptible of hard and fast rules. It would be much easier if it were. That is why people try to pretend that it is, or at least behave as if they thought so. In other words, the, these critics behave as though they're involved in some mathematical analysis when that's not the case at all. Okay, and in fact, when I interviewed uh, Dr. James White for our film *Bridge to Babylon*, and I was debating with him on camera, and he knew that you know we were we were opposed to each other, but I asked him about having unbelievers, people who do not believe the Bible, sitting on these Bible committees making decisions about what the readings of the text should be, and he said he said to me literally he said, well. Are you saying that you have to have a Christian worldview in order to be a textual critic? He said, well, that's like saying that you have to have a Christian worldview in order to be a heart surgeon. That was a comparison that he made. And, and because he's thinking, again, the, the, the argument that he's, that he's making is that, well, being a heart surgeon is just about technical knowledge about science and, you know, uh, biology and, and how the human body works. and. That's it, and uh, yeah, he, because this is, he's thinking, it's some kind of mathematical analysis that they're doing when they come up with these arguments. That's the position that many of them have, and it's why many of those who are professing Christians, and they even profess to be conservative Christians, it's why they're drawn in and they end up believing these theories, because they don't realize the theories are speculative, they're not mathematical. All right, so what do they rely upon? Well, as David has been talking about, and what I've touched on, what they rely upon is paleography. Paleography. Paleography, which is handwriting analysis and the analysis of the text. It is, uh, there's a book uh, by a guy named uh, Dirk Yonkind. It's called Scribal Habits of Codex Sinaiticus. And that title, okay, all right. Um, that title reveals much. What they do is they study the habits of scribes from one century to another. How did they write out their Greek characters? How did they lay out their columns and so on? Uh, what kind of uh, papyrus or, or vellum did they use? Papyrus is pre-fourth century, made from plants. Your vellum is animal skin and that's normalized after the fourth century. So that's one of the ways that they determine. Something's written on vellum, it's very likely after the fourth century. Um, but then they, they focus on the type of inks and dyes, etc. what the habits were of the scribes. So if they get a manuscript and they don't know where it came from, they look at how was it laid out, what methods are the scribes using, and then they go through history and they try to find another era, another century, where scribes created manus manuscripts in that way, using those methods, those scribal habits. And they say, oh, this looks like it came from the 5th, 6th, 7th century. That's, how they, that's paleography. That's all it is. And of course, the objections to that are, well, what happens if a scribe in the 10th century creates a manuscript and he's using scribal habits from 500 years earlier. He's using methods from earlier centuries. You see what I'm saying? And then if you discover that 500 years later, you could have a completely wrong view of where the manuscript came from. Anyway, so that brings us to paleography. Here is an article by Dr. James Westfall Thompson, the former president of 
of the American Historical Association. And he wrote an article called The Age of Mabillon and Mont Falcon. The Age of Mabillon and Mont Falcon. Okay? And he describes uh, these two Roman Catholic Benedictine monks, Jean Mabillon and Bernard de Montfalcon, that Brother David has been talking about in his presentations. And these were the two men who created paleography. Jean Mabillon created Latin paleography, and Bernard de Montfalcon created Greek paleography. But why did they create it? Well, Dr. Thompson tells us. Uh, now, it's important to remember that these two monks, they were part of an order of monks called the Marist Order. And they were dedicated to the Counter-Reformation. They were dedicated to overturning the great Protestant Reformation. So Dr. Thompson says this. He says, quote, Modern, critical, and interpretive historiography had its inception during the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. Lutheranism and Calvinism were attacks on the historical foundation of the Roman Church. Historical criticism became a Protestant weapon and documents were used as missiles. Probably the number one example was the donation of Constantine. The donation of Constantine that was a forged document that claimed that Constantine the Great had given most if not all the countries of Western Europe to the Pope. That was exposed as a forgery during the time of Luther and Martin Luther seized on that and he said, now I know that the Pope is truly the Antichrist. That's what he said. And there was this huge uproar and this was one of the things, one of the events that led to so many countries in Europe turning away from the papacy. And it was because one of their documents had been exposed as a forgery. And then they started going after other things. And Rome even admits there's a book called Vicars of Christ by Peter de Rosa, who's a former Catholic priest. And he wrote this book and revealed that the Vatican used to have a whole school of forgers inside the Vatican that would create one forgery after another. Okay, so Protestants were exposing this. So Dr. Thompson says the Roman Church was slow to take alarm over the Protestant appeal to history. It vainly endeavored to confine the dispute to questions of theology. Finally, however, the historical attack became so effective that Rome was compelled to fight history with history to combat fire with fire. Since the Reformation was an appeal to history, the Counter-Reformation was forced to use the same instrument with incalculable importance to the development of critical historical scholarship. Now, critical historical scholarship could also be called higher critical scholarship or higher criticism because that's what it is. And these are our two priests here, Mabillon on the left and Bernard de Montfalcon on the right. Now, I've got just a few minutes left, don't I, brother? Okay, all right, he's giving me another five. Give me five, okay. All right, <laughs> let me see if I can get through this. All right, Jean, Mabillon, Jean Mabillon and de Montfalcon. Now, these guys literally invented paleography. So what they're doing is they're inventing a system where they're saying, we must now take control of how documents are gonna be understood and interpreted throughout history in these two major languages, both Latin and Greek. We must be the ones to decide what methods will determine what is genuine, what is not genuine, what is a forgery, what's a corruption, what should be seen as an acceptable manuscript or codex or document or whatever it is. These, both of these men were studied by Constantine von Tischendorf, who's the leading scholar of the 19th century. He's the guy who discovered Codex Sinaiticus. He's the guy who was working with the Pope, with Cardinal Mai, who had uh, Codex Vaticanus, and uh, he studied the work of Jean Mabillon, and he also obtained a work by the famous Benedictine monk Bernard de Montfalcon, which in 1708 virtually created the study of Greek and Byzantine paleography. That is from the book Secrets of Mount Sinai by uh, James Bentley. And that is, a, that is a prominent book, by the way, 
in the critical text circles. Okay, now all of this takes us into, so you have Rome designing the system of interpretation to say this one is older and this one is better. So when they tell you that these manuscripts, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, that these are the most ancient and better and reliable manuscripts, that is based on a system that was designed specifically by Rome to point things in that direction. And as we saw earlier, what's the grand conclusion of the more than 6,000 manuscripts that we have out there that are a record of the Bible? What is the grand conclusion of the Westcott and Hort theory, according to Dean John Bergen. <laughs> he says, it all comes down to Codex B, Codex Vaticanus. What a coincidence. What a coincidence. All right, how much time have I got? I want to, I I well, I've got more. I'm going to have to show this in the next, well, this, I'll never be able to get through all of this. Okay, uh, all right, I'm going to point to two more things and then close with the scripture. Okay, one. I've been wanting to say this now throughout this uh, whole um, uh, conference that we're having because I think this is very important. Um, and I say this to encourage people who are defenders of the traditional text, defenders of the King James, okay? In America, and I think probably in Canada as well, we are winning the fight. We are winning the fight through the internet and through independent media. and. Shortly after, I, had, I, had, I, I went through really a nightmare experience for six months prior to my debate with James White because his supporters uh, you, you know, completely tried to discredit and to denounce me, as David could tell you, uh, for months before we had the debate because they were very angry because of what I was saying about Codex Sinaiticus. They started a website. They created uh, what we think was a fictional uh, character to, to write articles against me, all this other kind of stuff. There was a huge uproar on the internet in the States, so much so that it got a lot of attention. Well, shortly after I got through all of that, and I have to admit I was somewhat discouraged, but then I saw this article. I uh, saw this article in Christianity Today, and it said the most popular and fastest growing Bible translation isn't what you think it is. And then they go on in the article to reveal that the most popular and fastest growing Bible translation is the King James Bible. That you have more people reading the King James Bible, and this was in 2013, than any other Bible translation. And then if you go and you read the other articles about why that is, it's because of all these articles on the internet, all the work that's being done by the saints to defend the Word of God that when people want to turn to a real Bible and they want answers as to why all these Bibles have different readings, they go online, they're able to do their research, and they turn to the King James, praise the Lord. Now here's another statistic that I found shortly before the conference, and this shows there at the top, that's the people who are reading the King James, up at the top. Okay, and then the, the NIV is second. Okay, the KJV has like 31%. The NIV has 1.3% or 13%. Yeah, there it is, 13%. And then it goes down from there. But you can see more and more people are turning to the traditional text because they recognize that uh, this corruption is very, very deliberate. And when you've got quotes from people like Dean John Bergen, who examined the whole thing. And he wrote a letter to the bishop. And he said, my Lord Bishop, all of this appears to me. What in the language of lawyers is called conspiracy? I mean, he literally said, these men have conspired to undermine the word of God. That's what he said. Or he said, that's what it appears to him. Um, so I want to close with this. Isaiah chapter 40, one of my favorite scriptures, the voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for listening. God bless you guys.